2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and just before we begin uh, let me just say that you will know that the problem at the church in Thessalonica was to do with doctrinal error. There was, that's why Paul wrote to them. And uh, interestingly, the doctrine, the, the, the wrong teaching they were exposed to was affecting the behaviour. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians and he writes 2 Thessalonians to correct this wrong doctrine that was affecting the behaviour. The interesting thing is, the doctrine was all about the coming of the Lord. It was all about Bible prophecy. Now we might think that Bible prophecy, that's something for the Bible scholars. We don't need it in everyday life. We don't need to understand about the future. We just need to live our lives at the moment. We're not really uh, too worried about what's going to happen in the future. However, we understand from this letter that what we believe about the future determines how we behave in the present. What we believe about the future has an effect on how we behave in the present. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians and he writes 2 Thessalonians because there was a, a doctrinal problem about what was going to happen in the future. That's important. Now you will know, because we've mentioned this so many times, that when the Bible talks about the coming again of the Lord Jesus, it's in two parts. There is what we call the rapture, when the Lord Jesus comes to take the church away, all the believers away from this world, there will then follow a period called the tribulation, at least seven years. Then the Lord Jesus comes back and it's part two of his coming. He comes to the earth to set up his kingdom. And then after that, there is the millennium when he reigns for a thousand years on the earth. So that's the general picture. Now, Paul wrote First Thessalonians because there was a problem in their understanding about the rapture, the first part of his coming. And he wrote Second Thessalonians because there was a problem about their understanding about the second part of his coming, the revelation. And you see, what was happening in this second letter was this, that uh, people were bringing false teaching about the future, they were getting things all mixed up, and it had a bad impact on their behaviour. Now, brothers and sisters, we have to remember that, that what I believe about the future affects how I behave in the present. We're going to read this uh, chapter because this is really the heart of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, this is a difficult chapter to read. Uh, there are difficult concepts which I'll, I'll try to explain as best I can with the Lord's help. But let's read the chapter right through just to begin with. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ, it should actually be the day of the Lord, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come the falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what, the authorised version uses a word here, withholdeth. It really means what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now restrains, this is the same word, he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be judged or be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But 
We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. Now there's a lot to take in in this chapter. And you may have read through that and think, well, I don't understand half of that. Well, let's have a look at it. We're going to break it down into three parts. First of all, verses 1 and 2, Paul rejects the false teaching. He tells them, now, don't pay any attention to this false teaching. We're going to look at that briefly. And then he reminds them of the truth. Look at verse 5. He says, remember you not when I was yet with you. I told you these things. So Paul's not telling them anything new. He is telling them something he had told them before. He's reminding them of truth they'd heard when he was there. So that's from verse 3 down to verse 12, a very important section. And then from verse 13 to verse 17, he is reassuring the Christians. So there are three sections. First of all, he is rejecting the false teaching. Then he's reminding them of the truth he told them before, and he is reassuring them at the end. He, he comforts them, and he strengthens them, and he establishes them right at the end, once he's given them the truth about this matter. So let's look at the first section, verses 1 and 2. Here Paul rejects the false teaching. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, he's really talking about the rapture. He says, Now because the rapture is going to take place, uh, because in the light of this wonderful truth that the Lord Jesus has come and he's going to gather us all together to him, I beseech you, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Now, first of all, what was the problem anyway? What was the, what was the false teaching that was causing such a problem? Well, there were people saying that the day of the Lord was at hand. In other words, the day of the Lord, the word really is, the day of the Lord has begun, has started. And uh, Paul writes to tell them that is not the case. He wants to reject that idea. Now you might say, well, what's all that about? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find this expression, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, is spoken of many, many times in the Bible, the day of the Lord. And it really refers to a time when God is going to intervene in this world and he's going to bring judgment on this world and he is going to begin a divine intervention that will culminate in the Lord Jesus reigning for a thousand years. And it begins with the tribulation period. It begins with this period of great suffering on the earth. Now the problem was this. These Thessalonian Christians, they were suffering. There's no doubt about it. They were being persecuted. And people will say, you know what's happened? The rapture's passed. You've missed out on the rapture. And we're now in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord started. You're in the tribulation. There are Christians who believe that today. They believe the tribulation is going on at the moment. Or they believe that the Christians will be in the tribulation in the future. And Paul is saying, listen. People are telling you that the day of the Lord has started. I want to reject that. The day of the Lord has not started. Brothers and sisters, we might have troubles. We might have trials. Of course we will. We were thinking of that this morning. That if we are Christians in this ungodly world, we're bound to have problems. But Paul says, don't mistake your troubles. They might be massive to you. Don't mistake them for the great tribulation. There's no comparison. And Paul says, this period, the day of the Lord, has not even started yet. Don't pay any attention to those who say it has. How do they operate? Well, did you notice what it says in verse 2? By spirit, by word, nor by letter as from us. In other words, by spirit. 
These people were saying, you know, the Holy Spirit's revealed to me that we're, we're, we're in the tribulation. What's happening just now? Now, people look at the Middle East at the moment, and they say, this is what the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation. This is the tribulation. Brothers and sisters, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Paul says, anyone who stands up and says, now the Spirit has told me, I feel by the Spirit that we're in the tribulation period. Paul says, not at all. Or by word. Here's somebody teaching the Bible. And they're using verses from the Old Testament, and they're, they're misapplying them. You know, one of the problems of Bible interpretation is not so much understanding what the Bible is saying, it's applying it correctly to our situation. And some people have read the Bible and thought, the Bible talks about great suffering, that's where I am just now. I must be in that situation. Don't pay any attention to that, Paul says, even if it's by spirit, somebody says they've got spirit revelation, somebody says it's from the Word of God, or people were even forging letters. These false teachers were forging letters and saying, I've got a letter from Paul here. Listen to Paul says. Paul says, don't listen to any of that. Be absolutely clear, the day of the Lord has not started. And the effect this false teaching had on them was that they were shaken in mind and troubled. Now, in the Greek language, that's a very, very powerful thing. They were shaken out of their minds almost as the idea. They were, they were almost at their wit's end. Because they thought somehow they missed the rapture, they were in the day of the Lord, they were going to be exposed to the judgment of God. Paul says, listen, reject that teaching. Reject it. Now, you might be surprised to find, as I say, that teaching is around today. It's around today. It's very popular today. That Christians are going to go through the tribulation period. Reject it, Paul says. I want to reject that. And I'll tell you why. And he goes on now to remind them of truth that he's told them before. Now let's follow his reasoning here. <laughs> uh, nobody's going to fall asleep, I understand. Uh, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that is the day of the Lord, the day of tribulation, it will not come. Two things are going to happen first before that can come. First of all, before there come a falling away. Now that is literally the falling away. Literally it is the apostasy. Capital T, capital A. The apostasy. And linked to that at the same time, the man of sin is revealed. We're going to talk about this individual in a moment, but just to say at this point, the Bible talks about the Antichrist, it talks about the beast, it talks about a man who's going to be uh, prominent in the world, prominent in world affairs, prominent in the nation of Israel at the last times, uh, who is going to head up all the opposition against God. Now Paul says, the day of the Lord, this time of tribulation is coming, it can't start until there is this massive abandoning of all the truth of God and the man of sin comes to prominence. And he goes on to say, that can't happen, the man of sin can't happen. Look at verse 6. You know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. The mystery of iniquity already is at work. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. You see, I haven't a clue what that means. It means this. Paul says, now listen, before the tribulation begins, the apostasy is going to happen. People are going to turn completely away from the truth of God. And at the same time, there is going to rise to prominence the man of sin, the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. But he says, there's something that's keeping that down at the moment. There's something that's restraining that. And he says, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The world is full of evil, as we know. The, the, the world is evil at the moment. But there is something, <laughs> if I can use this expression, there is something keeping the lid on the pot. There is something and there is somebody who is restraining. And Paul says, when that person is removed, and when that thing is removed, the lid's going to come off the pot. And the man of sin cannot be revealed, and by extension, the day of the Lord cannot begin until the person who restrains and the thing that restrains is removed. You might say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, dear friends, the thing that restrains, because he says, verse 6, you know what restrains that it might be revealed. So something that restrains, that thing 
is the church. The fact that the church is here, uh, you know, we talk about salt and light. Well, the interesting thing is that the Bible talks about restraining in this time. You have no idea the presence of the church. That is every believer in the Lord Jesus. We're not talking about Church of Scotland or Church of England or Methodist Church. Or not that kind of church. We're talking about the church that comprises every believer in the Lord Jesus. Because it's still on earth, it is having a restraining power. And in fact, Paul says, the man of sin will not be revealed until the church is removed. But then he goes on to say, only, uh, sorry, the mystery of iniquity already works, only he who now restrains. Who's this person? Well, the interesting thing is that the Bible teaches that in this age in which we live, the Holy Spirit is here indwelling each believer in the Lord Jesus. But there's more than that. The Holy Spirit is indwelling the church. And so when the rapture takes place, Paul's really saying this is the rapture. When the rapture, I hope you're following this. <laughs> when the rapture takes place, the church is going to be removed and the special, the special presence of the Holy Spirit is going to be removed because the church is removed. And when that happens, bang, the floodgates are going to open. Now we think, brothers and sisters, but things are bad at the moment. You can hardly, you can hardly look at the news, you can hardly open a newspaper. You're shocked and horrified by what goes on today. It's nothing to what's going to happen when the church goes. Now Paul, the teaching is this. I hope you're following this. Paul says, listen, these people are saying the tribulation has started. Not at all. Not at all. He says, because, first of all, before that happens, there's got to be this massive rejection of all truth. And coupled with that, the appearance of this man of sin and, Paul says, these things cannot happen until the church is removed. You got that? So that's, that's the truth that he wants them to remember. That the day of the Lord, it can't be the day of the Lord now because the church is still here. The Holy Spirit is still here in the church. But once, once the restraining force is taken off, it's like a pot that's going to boil over. And as soon as the lid is taken off, bang, the whole thing is going to explode. Brothers and sisters, that's a dreadful time. Be thankful. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, be thankful you won't be here. You won't be here. The very fact that you're going is the thing that triggers the whole thing. When you go in the rapture, when the Lord Jesus takes you away, that's when the floodgates open. And, you know, John, when he was writing at the end of the New Testament, he says that uh, the spirit of Antichrist is working even now. If that was true back in John's day, how much more is it true today? There are forces of evil, brothers and sisters, we need to understand this. There are forces of evil at work in our world. And they're at work politically. Uh, they're at work religiously. They're at work culturally. And uh, our media and, and the whole world system, the Bible in fact describes it as the world is sitting in the lap of the wicked one. It, it's, a, it's a battleground. And Satan would love to do far more, but he can't, because you're here. <laughs> you say, well, I'm not doing much. Your very presence here in the church means that Satan is restrained. But the moment the church goes, the moment the restrainer is removed, then things are going to explode. And you wonder, you know, some people say, well, you know, when you read the book of Revelation about the seals being opened and the judgments being poured out, everything seems to happen so quickly, so quickly. How is it that things can change so quickly? Friends, we forget our own history. Do you remember 2020? Do you remember a, 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 a remote virus somewhere in the world? And, and then suddenly the whole planet is in lockdown. And it happened almost overnight. Now, friends, when the church is removed, there will be an explosion of evil. All the pent up evil that wants to express itself and is restrained at the moment, it's going to explode. Paul says, don't worry about it, you're not going to be there. Well, that's good, isn't it? Now, before we leave this section, I want to say something about the man of sin. People are interested in this, aren't they? The mark of the beast, who is the Antichrist. Uh, people think it's a Donald Trump. I don't think so. Um, you know, is it, it, people thought it was uh, Adolf Hitler. People thought it was Napoleon. 
Uh, there have been figures that have arisen in history, and I have no doubt, uh, particularly men like Adolf Hitler, there's no doubt that that was the spirit of Antichrist. The desire to eliminate the Jews. Uh, what's going on in the Middle East at the moment? Make no mistake about it. It is far deeper than we want a piece of ground. Uh, th there are forces that want to exterminate the Jews. And they don't even perhaps understand why that is the case. Why they want to do it. I'll tell you why they want to do it. Because Satan wants to exterminate the Jews. And in the tribulation he's going to try and do that. And uh, But there's going to arise this man. Let's just think of him for a minute. He's called, we're going to think of his character first of all. Notice that he's got different titles here. He is called in verse 3, the man of sin. The man of sin. That word sin really means the man of lawlessness. So here is a man whose whole character is built around a refusal to submit to the law of God. That's what sin really is. You know, when Adam committed his first sin in the Garden of Eden, it was lawlessness. The Bible teaches us that all sin is lawlessness, really. It's a refusal to submit to God's divine law. And here is a man who embodies the spirit. Now, I would say, just in a general way, that we're living in a day where there has never been such a contempt for figures of authority. Now, you might tell me they deserve that. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. But there has never been such a, a, a desire just to do my own thing. And I won't do what anyone tells me, whether it's your parents in the home, whether it's your teachers at the school, whether it's uh, uh, the police, as Brian will tell us, uh, whatever, whatever the figure of authority is. Now, here is a man who embodies this idea of not being subject to anybody but me. I'm in charge. It's lawlessness. That's what sin is. So he's called the man of sin, and then he's called the son of perdition. The son of perdition. That means that he is doomed, he's destined for perdition. He's, you know, the Victorians, or it was actually the medieval, I shouldn't blame the Victorians, the medieval Christians had this idea of hell and the lake of fire as being a place where demons pitchforked human beings into oblivion and, uh, and into the flames and, and, and where demons tormented them and so on. How completely wrong that is. The Bible tells us that, that the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not for them to live in it, for them to be punished in it. It's their punishment. It's not their place. It's not where they live. They're going to be punished. And because men and women have sided with Satan against God, they're going to be there too. And, and so this man, he might be the man of sin, who owns no law but himself, but he is the son of perdition. And then when we read in verse 8, we discover he's described as, then shall that wicked one. He's, he's, he's wicked. He's a wicked man. And so he's described in terms of his character. And then he's described in terms of his aims. Look at verse 4. He speaks about, Paul speaks about this man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You know what this man's aim is? It's not simply to rule on the earth, it's to take the place of God. That's what it is. That's the whole meaning of Antichrist. It's not simply against Christ, it is against Christ, but it's the idea of a false Christ, it's replacing Christ. And you know the first sin in the universe wasn't Adam's sin. The first sin wasn't Adam's sin. The first sin was Satan's sin. Before Adam ever sinned, Satan sinned. And what was Satan's sin? Satan said, I want to be on that throne. I want to have that place. Now, here is a man who is energized by Satan and he wants to be God. He wants to be God. And he's, this is the old lie that Satan told Adam and Eve back in the garden. If you rebel against God, you will be as gods. And, and, and it might be a bizarre statement, but a lot of the people you meet in the street, they want to be God. In other words, they want to be God of their own life, at least, if it won't be us's. And this man, and we read about it in the book of Revelation, what's going to happen is this, there's going to be an image that's set up in the temple in Jerusalem. 
And this is the image of the beast. And people are going to be commanded to worship this image. And there's going to be a false prophet. And he has power to give life to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast is going to speak. And they're going to deceive the whole world. And people are going to think, this man is God. They're actually going to think, this man is Christ. This man's the Messiah. He's got such power. And so his uh, methods, uh, sorry, his aims are to take the place of God. And brothers and sisters, this is the culmination of man's rebellion against God. It started back in the Garden of Eden. You might think, just such a small thing. Eat a bit of fruit. God told them not to eat it. What started there as you might call a minor, nobody gets hurt kind of sin, will ultimately culminate in a man trying to take the very place of God. Now, his methods in doing so, if you look at verses 9 to 10, his coming is after the effectual working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they believe not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, a lot of uh, interesting language there, but what Paul is saying is this, that this man is going to come with mass deception. He's going to come with mass deception. He is going to deceive people. He's going to deceive the politicians. He's going to deceive the priests. He's going to deceive people who are religious. He's going to deceive people who are irreligious and who are political. He is going to uh, perform miracles with signs and wonders that will make people think that this man comes from God. He's our saviour. He's the one who's going to sort everything out. And this is the way he works. And look at verse 11. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe, literally this is, the lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but a pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, people who rejected the gospel in this present age, they are going to be deluded. They're going to be deceived by this man and they are going to be judged finally. God is going to send them a strong delusion that they believe the lie. Now, what is the lie? Well, scholars have debated this. Perhaps it's the lie that he's claiming to be God. Maybe that's the lie. Some suggest it's the lie that will explain what's happened to all the Christians. What happened to what happened to them? There's going to be some explanation for that. What's this lie? The whole, the whole, this man is a whole lie. Everything he says is a lie. And you remember what it says about Satan? He was a liar from the beginning. From the beginning. He is at the end. He's a liar. And these people are going to be deceived. Sadly, all who did not believe the truth. So people who miss out on the rapture because they've never trusted Christ to be their saviour. If they've rejected the truth, it seems to me from this verse that these will be deluded and deceived by the Antichrist who's going to arise in a coming day. But before we leave this man, I want to think about his doom. His doom. That's good news. Verse 8. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. Now listen to this. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now let's think about that for a minute. Isn't this wonderful? And so we read in the book of Revelation, things are getting worse and worse. Israel surrounded by her enemies. This Antichrist who's guaranteed their security, he's broken his covenant with Israel. He set his image up in the temple. People are receiving the mark of the beast. They're worshipping him. And the whole world is in turmoil. And it seems that evil is going to win. And the nation of Israel are going to be obliterated, wiped out. And just at the moment when it seems everything is lost, we read in Revelation chapter 19 that the heavens are going to open. And there's going to come out a figure on a white horse. It's pictorial language. But it's talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus. Whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth. You know what literally is? With the breath of his mouth. And somebody is saying, here is Satan's man on earth. The Antichrist. And he's got great power. And he can, he can do wonderful things. And he's got ultimate power it seems. And the Bible says, when the Lord, when the Lord comes... He's going to breathe on him and he's going to destroy him. He's going to just, he's going to consume him by breathing on him. That's what he's going to do. 
Brothers and sisters, never forget this. Our Lord is far greater than any other foe. He's greater than any other power. God's greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We can get overwhelmed and, and, and anxious and fearful when we think of the power of Satan. Brothers and sisters, remember this. Now, the Lord Jesus is going to breathe on this man and he's going to wither up, somebody said, like a moth in the candle. He's going to be consumed by the breath of his mouth and, listen to this, shall destroy with the majesty of the brightness of his appearing. The very, it doesn't, you know, we talk about the final battle. And we talk about, we, we imagine, you know, a battle can rage to and fro, it can be, you wonder how it's going to go, and, and then suddenly one side gets the, it's going to be nothing like that. There's going to be no contest. The Lord, when he appears from heaven, he's going to breathe on this man of sin, and he's going to consume him, and he is going to destroy him. That word literally means bring to nothing. Bring, see, this man wants to be everything. He wants to be top, he wants to be God. He's going to be brought to nothing. By, how does he do it? By the brightness of his coming, the glory of Christ. You know, we sometimes sing about the beauty of the Saviour. When the Lord comes back in glory, it's going to dazzle every eye. I'll tell you this, it's going to destroy the Antichrist. One flash of the glory of Christ, our, our blessed Saviour, is going to shrivel him up. And so the man of sin is going to meet his doom. Isn't that wonderful? Paul says, now, remember I told you these things. <laughs> You know, we said this before, but it's amazing. These were young Christians. You might think, oh, these, these subjects are far too deep. You know, keep these for, for, for Bible colleges and so on. Don't tell. Paul had only been there a few weeks and he told them all this. He told us all to them about what was coming, about the Lord's coming. Brothers and sisters, I, I think to myself, we need to be more talking about this kind of subject. And even with young Christians. Tell them what the Bible says. Never mind about future events in terms of the world, what's happening today. People, don't, don't be too worried about what's going on today and, and don't read too much into what's happening today. Read what's happening according to the Bible. Uh, let's stick to that. Uh, we'll find that that will keep us right. So, Paul rejects the false teaching. He reminds them of the truth. And then, finally, he reassures them. Look at verse 15. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you. I've underlined that for you. You see, Paul's talked about people that are going to be deceived, they're going to be lost, they're going to be siding with the Antichrist, they're going to share in the Antichrist doom. But, but Paul says, but when we think about you, brothers and sisters, it's a different story altogether. We're bound to give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because, now I might have thought Paul would go on to say, because you believed. That's not what he says. He is going to talk about belief. But he says, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, one of the ways that he reassures them is this. You know, we focus, when we were converted, we focus on our decision, our turning to God, our repentance, our faith. And that is very true. We have to believe. We are responsible to respond to the gospel message. But Paul says, listen, don't you think that that was the first time God thought about you? God thought about you right at the beginning. Right? You were chosen. Now, now I believe this with all my heart. The Bible teaches me that I'm going to be in heaven because as a young boy, I trusted Jesus Christ to be my saviour. I responded to the gospel message. But it tells me this as well, that I'm going to be in heaven because I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Do you believe that? God chose me. And he chose you too. If you're a believer in Christ, he chose you too. You say, well, I, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, I don't understand that. No, neither do I. But I believe it. And somebody says, well, surely if God chooses people to be saved, then he must choose people to be lost. The Bible never says that. The Bible never says that. But it says this, that every single person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ can say, I was chosen from the beginning. And what he's trying to tell them is this, in the big picture, their salvation, their future salvation, remember he's trying to reassure them, is not on my poor grasp of God. 
It's in God's might for me. It's not, it's not that I chose God. In a sense, I did choose the Lord Jesus. But Paul says, the bigger picture is he chose you. And so, how can you be lost? How can you go through the tribulation? And so he says, he called you, verse 14, by our gospel to obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So instead of doom and judgment and wrath, when the Lord Jesus comes, we are destined for glory. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? We need to be reassured by that. Therefore, he says, verse 15, stand fast and hold the traditions. In other words, don't be, this is in contrast to, look at verse 2. He talks about being soon shaken in mind and troubled. That's the, that's the effect that bad teaching has on people. It makes them upset. It shakes them up. Good teaching, the word of God, has this effect. It makes us stand fast and it makes us firm in holding the truth of God. And then he prays at the end. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who have loved us and given us everlasting consolation. <laughs> Is it getting any better? Yes. <laughs> everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Remember, brothers and sisters, what we believe about the future affects how we behave in the present. If I think I'm going to be under God's judgment, that makes me a shaky Christian. We have enough shaky people around. Let's not be shaky Christians. We need to be solid Christians. We need to be grounded. We need to be calm. We need to be those that don't panic when we see things unfolding across the world stage because we know what God's purpose is. The Lord Jesus is coming. The man of sin, this dreadful character, he can't even, he can't lift his head above the parapet until the Christians have gone. So we'll be out of here. Before people, people think I've recognized the Antichrist, I know who he is. Uh, well, that's a bad sign because the Christians are not going to see him <laughs> because they're going to be gone before he even makes his appearance. And Paul says, When the Lord Jesus comes back, part two of the coming of Christ, he is going to destroy the Antichrist. The man has said, Now he says, On the basis of that, you stand firm, hold fast, don't be moved, don't be shaken, and abound in the work of the Lord because you see if you're worried and concerned about the future and about your destiny and so on it paralyzes you but if you know what God has planned and God's purposes then it sets you free to serve him as we should let's pray father we give thanks for these chapters they are difficult for us to understand but we pray for help to get the main parts of this wonderful passage of scripture we pray that we may understand thy purpose, thy will, and we give thanks that these things give us assurance and comfort us. And we pray that we may be even in this uh, situation in which we find ourselves in the world at the moment. So we seek thy help. We give thanks for our time together. And we thank thee for the refreshments we're going to enjoy now. In the Lord's name. Amen. Amen.